in Luke chapter 1, one of the most wonderful portions of Scripture. I always feel like when we come into the Christmas month, we're, we're stepping into holy ground. And uh, the doctrine, the meaning, this is the cornerstone of our faith. Uh, who is Jesus Christ? And so today we're going to begin uh, with Luke 1, 26. If you don't have a Bible, there's notes in the bulletin. You can look next to your neighbor. Let's read along together, shall we? And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Israel forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the marvelous truths in your word this morning. We thank you that your grace came down to us. And I ask you, Lord, now to speak to our hearts and to change our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, one of my favorite songs is the song, Mary, Did You Know? How many of you have ever heard that Christmas song, Mary, Did You Know? And sometimes when I hear that first phrase, Mary, Did You Know? My immediate reaction is, of course she knew. The angel told her. Uh, it's a great song, though, anyways. I love every line of it. Mary, Did You Know? And, and here we find that Mary did know because Mary was told about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today we begin a four-week series on the grace of Christmas. Many of you have studied grace and you're aware of the various definitions. One of my favorite definitions is that grace is unmerited favor. It is granted freely to us. Uh, one of the definitions I learned when I was a boy in Sunday school went like this. Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Let's say that together. God's riches at Christ's expense. So God giving us His rich blessings through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if there has ever been a picture of grace, it has been the coming down of God's Son to planet Earth, God in His grace manifesting Himself to us. For we know that Emmanuel is God with us. When we opened the book of Luke, it had been some 400 years since God had, in some form of revelation, made, his, his, made himself known to uh, his people, the children of Israel. And God now is beginning to rustle the hearts and minds of his people after this period of silence between the Testaments. And he has made himself known not only uh, to Zacharias and Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist, but now he comes to Mary. And now we see that God is beginning to reveal His will concerning the redemption of mankind, even to Mary. Pastor George Truett, who pastored the First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas in the 1940s, said these words, Christ was born in the first century, yet He belongs to all centuries. He was born a Jew, yet He belongs to all races. He was born in Bethlehem, yet He belongs to all countries. And this morning on every continent, 
there are people worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ and giving thanks for the grace of God that even though he was born as a Jew in Bethlehem, Jesus came for all of us in all generations and in every country. And this morning, we hear the announcement. We understand more about how it all happened. And I want you to see in the first place today the proclamation of grace, how grace was announced to this world. The Bible says in verse 26, in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. The story unfolds in this little place called Nazareth. Nazareth is in the Galilean region. Uh, I uh, believe about 12 miles, maybe 9 miles uh, to the west of the Sea of Galilee. And uh, it really was nothing more than a small military village in the first century. It was uh, a place that held a Roman uh, garrison. Uh, there was an outpost, a military outpost there. Scholars tell us maybe a few hundred people lived in Nazareth. The most famous thing in Nazareth was the spring where people would go to get water. And I have stood at that spring. It is called today Mary's Spring. And it was a place where people on their journey, maybe going up towards Lebanon, would stop and they would receive water. And it was in this unsuspecting village that God chose to make this grand announcement. And the Bible tells us that the angel made a sudden appearance there in Nazareth. The Bible tells us, in fact, in verse 26, uh, that it was in the city of Galilee named Nazareth, and that the appearance was to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph. Here we see in verses 26 and 27 an angel coming to Nazareth. His name was Gabriel. Gabriel means the warrior of God. And it had been 550 years since Gabriel had first appeared to Daniel, and he had given revelation to Daniel. And then also it was Gabriel that had come to Zacharias there at the altar of incense in the temple of Jerusalem and had announced the birth of John the Baptist. And so Gabriel is a revelatory angel. He is a, an angel that gave the message of God as a mighty warrior of God. And he comes down in a sudden appearance to this little obscure village in Galilee to tell uh, this surprised woman what God was going to do. And so we see a sudden appearance, but notice we see a surprised audience, an audience of one. The Bible says it was a virgin espoused to a man. I want you to notice, first of all, that Mary was a pure woman. And I want you to see that there are three different times in one verse that God tells us she was either a virgin or that she was espoused to a man. God's Holy Spirit takes great care to identify not only the name of this woman, Mary, but also the nature of this woman. She was a pure woman. Uh, some believe 16 or 17 years old at the time. She was not a woman that had been out uh, living in fornication. She was not a woman that was just a woman of the street. Uh, she was a godly woman. We'll see more about that in a moment. She was a virgin. She was chaste. She was pure. She is the unnamed woman of Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15 is the very first prophecy of the coming of Christ to the world. And the Bible says concerning this woman that God would put enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of Satan. And that God was going to use the seed of the woman to bruise the head of Satan. And Bible scholars wonder about that verse. And then they begin to realize a woman does not produce seed uh, seed does not come from the woman, uh, and no woman can have seed without a man, except this woman, this woman would conceive of the Holy Ghost, and that this woman, her seed, this woman, her son, would destroy ultimately Satan and bruise his head. Oh, Satan would bruise the heel of Christ, but Jesus Christ would bruise the head of Satan. And so this woman, Mary, is the woman that was prophesied in the Old Testament. She is called a blessed woman. I want you to see that in verse 28. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. She was highly favored. She was full of grace. The Lord was with her. How many of you would agree with me that uh, someone may have wealth and material things, but it is most important to have the favor of God? Mary was highly favored. 
As Baptists, we do not pray to Mary. Very simply, we do not pray to Mary because the Bible does not tell us to pray to Mary. We do not worship Mary. We do not worship statues. We do not worship the saints. And the reason for that is we pray uh, to the Father through the Son. The Bible says there is one mediator between God and man, and it is the man, Christ Jesus. So when we pray, we pray to the Father in Jesus' name. Some of you were raised in religious traditions where you saw maybe statues of Mary, and there are some who teach that you should pray to Mary uh, in order to get your prayers up to God. One of my missionary friends in Mexico was talking to a lady about this issue and, and who do you pray to? Who do you bring your prayers to? And he said, well, it's like this. He said, uh, when you have a problem, do you want to talk to your doctor or your doctor's mother? How many of you are thankful we can talk directly to the Lord? I remember years ago, I had the privilege of spending a few days in Italy and, and we saw many things there and the Colosseum and so forth, and we went into some of the large churches, and I saw people who were praying uh, to the statues, praying to Mary, praying to the statue of baby Jesus, praying to statues of the apostles, and praying to the uh, embalmed corpses of the former popes. I watched as they gave money into the little boxes, and, and I watched as they prayed, and, and uh, this is a country that is still in uh, the tradition of Catholicism. And then we traveled north and we went into the country of Switzerland and into other places that had been touched by what is called the Reformation. The Reformation period, we just celebrated the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. It was a period of time where people like Martin Luther and, and William Tyndale and John Haas, they began to realize the just shall live by faith Salvation is through Christ alone. And people began to turn to Jesus Christ to be their Savior. And what was interesting was when you crossed the border from one country to the next and you went into a church, there were no idols on the walls. There was no idol of Mary. There was no Jesus on a cross. There was no uh, idol of a saint. There were no prayers being made to the saints. Why? Because when you understand what grace is all about, grace is God coming down to us so that through Jesus we have immediate access to God the Heavenly Father. And so we do not worship Mary, but we're so thankful for Mary. The Bible says here that she was highly favored. In fact, notice it says that she was blessed amongst women. Blessed art thou among women. She was a woman that was prepared. She was a vessel that was ready for the use of God. And this is the proclamation that was made to her, that God's Son would come to this world through her. We see the proclamation of grace, but notice, secondly, the person of grace. Who is this person that Mary would bring into the world. Verse 30, the Bible says, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Now here we see that this person of grace would be shown to us in the form of the gift of a child. Uh, Gabriel delivers the surprising news that her baby uh, would be the Son of God, and that His name would be called Jesus. And we know that this is a wonderful name, Jesus. And we know that Mary would bring forth uh, Jesus in order that we might have redemption for our sin. Now look in your notes at Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14, and let's just take a moment to get a hold of the truth somewhat theologically this morning. Notice in Hebrews 2, 14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part in the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Now these little children before us this morning, they are in bodies of flesh. How many of you know that we are more than flesh? For the Bible says, God breathed into Adam and Adam became a living soul. All of us will live eternally somewhere. But God tells us that even as a little child, as a partaker of flesh and blood, that he also, Jesus, took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that hath the power of death, that is to say the devil. Jesus Christ, listen very carefully, was born that he might die. 
He was born, according to Genesis 3.15, that he might bruise the heel of Satan. As the seed of the woman, Jesus Christ, God's Son, came in order that we might have victory over Satan. I'm going to preach more about that tonight. And let me tell you, my friend, if Jesus Christ is in you and his blood has covered your sin, Satan cannot possess you, Satan cannot have you, and you are on victory ground when you have Christ as your Savior. And in John 1.14, the Bible says, and the Word, that's speaking of Jesus, the eternally preexistent Word, the Word became flesh. This is Jesus in the manger. This is Jesus walking on the shores of Galilee. This is Jesus casting out the money changers in the temple. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. He was divine perfection. And Charles Spurgeon said of Christ, He who never began to be, but eternally existed, began to be what He eternally was not, and continued to be what He eternally was. In other words, in eternity past, He was not in the form of man. But he began to be in Bethlehem's manger what he was not in eternity past. And yet while he was in the flesh, he never stopped being God. He was the God-man. If you understand that, say amen this morning. Jesus Christ is the God-man. That's the significance of this gift. And while some say that he is merely a prophet or he was just another good man or he was a man that became God, no, no, no. The Bible tells us he always was God and he became man, but he never stopped being God while he was man. And that is important because when he died on the cross of Calvary, he didn't die up there as the son of Joseph. He died as the son of God for your sin and for mine. And so he is God's gift of grace. There was a husband and a wife during the Depression that realized during the Great Depression they would not be able to give their son Peter any Christmas presents. And uh, they gathered around, the three of them, and they said, Peter, we cannot afford a present for you this year. And so what we would like to do is we're going to draw with these color crayons on this paper, a picture of what we would all like to give each other for Christmas this year. And so uh, Christmas morning came and, and uh, little six-year-old Peter gathered there with his mom and dad and, and uh, sure enough, they began to give each other these pictures and uh, the wife gave to her husband a picture of a black limousine and a speedboat and, a, and the husband gave his wife a picture of a diamond bracelet and a fur coat. And, uh, and they drew a picture of a camping tent and some cars for Peter. And then it was Peter's turn to give his picture to his mom and dad. And he pulled it out. And the picture had a man and a woman hugging one another and a little boy with them, all of them embraced. And underneath the picture was one word, us. All Peter really wanted for Christmas was to be together with his family. And God wanted to be with us. And that's how much God loves you. God came down to us in the form of his son Jesus. And he is our gift. He is God's gift this Christmas. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. He is your gift and he is my gift, the gift of the child. But then notice the greatness of this gift. The greatness of this gift. There are some gifts that if you give someone, they may not immediately appreciate it. How many of you ladies would be okay if your husband gave you, let's just say, a three-carat diamond for Christmas? How many of you would let that pass? Come on, ladies, this is your chance. Come on, get with the program here. How many of you understand if you gave a three-year-old a three-carat diamond? Come on, help me. I mean, who knows what they might do with it? They might eat it. <laughs> they might give it to their doll. They might give it to their neighbor. And I remember when I was saved in 1972, I knew I was a sinner. I knew that I could not get myself to heaven. I knew that Jesus was God's son. I knew that he shed blood on the cross, and I called out and I accepted him as my Savior. But I have to tell you that this past week, as I've been thinking about it, 
And every time I think about it, I appreciate Him more. I appreciate more and more what God did for me. This gift that He gave to me. The fact that He came down from heaven for me. The greatness of Jesus Christ is something that, that should magnify in value to us year after year after year. I told the men this morning, I want to sing Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. That song's been on my mind all week long to think that Jesus is mine. This is my gift, a relationship with Jesus Christ, and He has come down uh, as God's gift to me. And I want you to think about the greatness of Jesus. First of all, the Bible says in verse 31, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shalt bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He is our Savior. His name is Jesus. It is the derivative of the word Joshua and it means deliverer and it's a wonderful name and the Bible says it is the name that is above every name and the Bible says that one day that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess the name of Jesus Christ the Bible says neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name given under heaven whereby you must be saved when you got saved you didn't say uh, a prayer uh, to Allah you didn't say a prayer to Buddha you did not say a prayer to your grandpa there was a name in your mind. It was the Lord. It was Jesus. Hey, Jesus is a wonderful name and His name shall be called Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And so the word Jesus means our deliverer. That's why we ought to teach our children not to say His name in vain. Not even to say J-E-E-Z. Not even to say God's name in vain. We ought to keep that name special and precious it's our deliverer's name his name is wonderful his name is Jesus Amen. and this is what Gabriel said Mary his name is Jesus because he's the deliverer and then he said in verse 32 he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest he said his name is great it's a mega name it's a wonderful name and He is before all things, and by Him all things are held together. By Him all things consist. It's a preeminent name. And then it says there in verse 32 also, that He shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord shall give Him the throne of His father David. Here we see that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Here we see that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. In fact, notice if you would in your notes, in, in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8, it says, but unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Here is God the Father speaking to God the Son. Here is God the Father speaking to Jesus, and he says, But thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. His name is Jesus, but his name is God. Some people say, well, uh, he was a human being on this earth, and and uh, some people deny the deity of Jesus Christ. But I'm simply pointing out to you that if God the Father called Jesus God, then He is God. He is the f God in the flesh. He is the Son of God, but He is called God. In fact, look in your notes at Matthew 1.23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call His name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is, say it with me, who is with us? God is with us. In this day of polytheism, in this day of multiculturalism, in this day of ecumenicism, where people are telling us that all religions are the same and all roads go to the same place and it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you really believe it. We must hold to the doctrine, the cornerstone of our doctrinal faith, and that is that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He is the Son of God. Not only that, He is sovereign. For the Bible says here in verse number 32 that the Lord shall give unto Him the throne of His father David and He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of His kingdom there shall be no end. You see, Isaiah speaks of this for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called wonderful counselor 
Here it is, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and of the increase of His government and of His peace. There shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon His kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice henceforth even forever. You, you see, Jesus Christ is told in the Scripture to be the one who will literally rule and reign over God's people and over all of the world. And here we see that He is the one who will fulfill the promises made to David that of His kingdom there would be no end. And so we have a proclamation of grace. That proclamation is made to a woman in Nazareth named Mary by the angel Gabriel. We meet this morning the person of grace. He is God in the flesh. He is Jesus. He is the Savior of the world. But then I want you to see finally this morning the practice of grace. Now I say to you this morning that there are many people who say they know Jesus, but their life is no different for it. And I believe that when you meet Jesus Christ, He begins to change your life. He begins to give you grace to respond in life. And that knowing Christ and knowing His grace produces grace in you. And I want you to see that grace in Mary this morning. How does she respond? Notice if you would in verse 34. And Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? This is the fourth reference to her purity. How can this happen, Gabriel? I, I, I don't know a man. How can I have a baby? And what would people think? And how would this be perceived if I were to become pregnant before marriage? I'm engaged, but I've not been married. So how, how is this going to happen? Verse 35, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold thy cousin Elizabeth, she also hath conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. We hear Gabriel here, uh, encouraging Mary. And he says to her finally in verse 37, For with God nothing shall be impossible. How many of you are thankful for that this morning? Nothing shall be impossible. So I want you to see Mary's response. First of all, we see that she receives God's plan. She questions the plan, but she's listening. She's receiving what Gabriel is saying. She receives, as the miracle is described, that this manner will not be after the manner of other pregnancies, that the Holy Ghost would come upon her. This would not be a man that would bring about the conception. The seed would not be from a man. It would be from the Holy Ghost. There would be a moment, if you will, of divine intervention. This would be the work of God in overshadowing her. This would be the Spirit of God uh, bringing about life in her. Christ must be both God and man to atone for sin. But for this to occur, he must be conceived by the Spirit and born of a, of a human virgin. No one else in the history of the world is conceived by the Spirit and born of a virgin mother. Therefore, Jesus Christ alone qualifies to be our Savior. And this was the miracle that was being described, that in a moment of divine anesthesia, the Spirit of God would come upon Mary, and she would be great with child because of the work of the Holy Spirit. The miracle was described and then it is determined to be the will of God for with God all things are possible and so Mary stands there in Nazareth and and she receives that and but I must say to you it's one thing to receive a message many of you are receiving and in, in, in the auditory sense you're receiving what I'm saying it's one thing to receive it it's another thing to believe it and I want you to know that Mary believed God's plan and I want you to see the grace of Mary in verse 38 as we close. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Be it unto me according to thy word. Let us say this phrase. Be it unto me. One more time. Be it unto me. Now Mary could have argued. And we live in an argumentative day. Do we not? Mary could have questioned. We see stickers. Question authority. Mary could have said, you know, I just need to work through this a little bit. But Mary simply says to the angel, be it unto me according to thy word. This is God's grace in Mary's life. 
This is God working in Mary's heart. In Luke 22, we read similar words from our Lord, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but say it with me, thy will be done. Is this what Mary is saying? Mary is foreshadowing the very words of her son that would be uttered 33, 34 years later. And we see this spirit of grace. The spirit of grace always comes to a point of accepting the sovereignty of God. The spirit of grace is a spirit that does not argue with God. It does not rebel against God. It is a spirit that is accepting toward the leading of God. One author said, the world's most popular prayer is, thy will be changed. But the world's greatest prayer is, thy will be done. Are you praying thy will be changed or thy will be done? She yielded to his will and she yielded to his word. Be it unto me according to thy word. I wonder this morning if there's someone here who would say, Pastor, I've been kind of pushing back on the Lord. I, 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 I've in a, I'm in a situation that I wasn't expecting and, and, and I, I know the Bible says trust in the Lord, but I'm having difficulty trusting in the Lord right now. Things did not go the way that I thought they should go. And I'm, I'm a little frustrated about it and maybe a little bit ticked off about it or maybe confused about it. And I just want to challenge you. Let this be your moment of grace when you say, Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. I was talking with my, my dad the other day and just about some challenges with my mom's health and with his health and being up in there. Uh, upper years and facing some things they're facing. And I'll never forget a phrase my dad said to me. He said, Paul, this wasn't the way I planned it. This wasn't the way I planned it. Man proposes, God disposes. And at those moments of life when it wasn't the way you planned it, I don't suggest switching spouses, switching churches, switching this, getting mad, pouting, drinking, drugs, none of it. But I do suggest, take a look at Mary. What did Mary say? Mary simply said, this wasn't in my playbook, but be it unto me according to thy word. And I encourage you this morning to say, Lord, according to your will, I yield and with a gracious spirit, I follow you to do your will. If you're here this morning and you have never received God's grace and forgiveness, you do not know that the blood of Jesus Christ has been applied to your account. You do not know the grace of God and the forgiving of sin and giving you a home in heaven. Today could be the day when Jesus Christ delivers you from the penalty of sin and gives you a home in heaven. And that's why he came. That's who Jesus is. He is the deliverer. And if he is your deliverer and you are saved, then I ask you, is there something going on in your life today that you just need to say, be it unto me according to thy word.